okay, it's recycling night, which is to say it's the night before recycling day when they send around the trucks and pick up all this stuff. So it's time to decide what goes out, what can be recycled, and what it gets tossed. Let's see now. Well, this one's easy. Here's some newspapers. And they can, of course, weeks worth of the news. There's goes that. Now, what else have we got here? Uh, all right. Old hairbrush that can go in a plastic container. And, you know, you know this is an old bottle of pomegranate juice. I'm Molly Bentley. While right. Seth Shostak does that, let me say welcome to Big Picture Science, produced at the SETI Institute, where researchers investigate the nature and origin of life. On Big Picture Science, we step back to get the wide-angle view on science and technology, and in this episode, how we can recycle everything, but choose not to. Oh, here's my plastic owl, designed to, you know, scare away the... The pigeons, I guess that can go in here. Boxes. Plus, a device that pulls water from desert air and a resource which we cannot replenish. You may be standing on it. It's what goes around. Put the box of ice cream sandwiches. I guess they can go in with a cardboard, right? No, wait a minute, they're laminated, so forget that one. Uh, no, wait, this is taking longer than I thought. Okay, well, I, I guess I finished the sorting here. Uh, newspapers pile that's been put in here plastic containers but not the clam shells uh, they're all ready to go into this container here meanwhile i have a huge pile of garbage just destined for nothing but a landfill you know here's a real mystery this old suitcase with the busted zippers um that, that doesn't fit in any of these recycle bins what am i going to do i could leave it out on the street but you know the neighbors already don't think very much of me I don't know, why can't I recycle that? Tom Zaki would figure out a way if he hasn't already. He's the CEO and founder of TerraCycle, a small business in New Jersey that has found innovative ways to take any kind of waste and recycle or repurpose it. TerraCycle runs recycling programs all over the world. Tom Zaki's motto may as well be, waste not. Everything can be recycled, he says, even if it's revoltingly dirty or toxic. Tom, the soda can is the poster item for recycling, or at least it used to be. What has taken its place? You know, it's an interesting question. I would say today the most recycled item in the world is clear glass. And I mention clear glass because many people don't know colored glass, like brown or green glass, typically is not recycled because there's not good markets for it. But this goes to a bigger question, which is, Many things people think perhaps are recyclable, like uh, colored PET. PET is a type of plastic that a soda may be uh, uh, bottled in, are not recycled today. You know, a lot of the things we put in our recycling bin may just end up on the other end. So I'd say clear glass is probably the best today. Well, hold on. Some of the things we put into our recycling bin, you say they end up on the other end. You mean they end up in a dump on the other end, or what do you mean? What happens when you fill your recycling bin with uh, recyclable materials is a garbage company picks it up, takes it to a place called the MRF, which is basically a sorting center. And what they're doing is they're sorting out things of value, basically things they can make money on. Aluminum cans, clear glass, some paper, newspaper, things like that. And typically 30 to 50% goes out the other end and ends up in your local landfill. But this goes to the question, you know, can we live in a world today even if we recycled everything that is dependent on disposable packaging. Because even recycling, the idea of recycling, which is wonderful, validates the concept of waste. And waste is an incredibly modern idea. You know, it wasn't around 100 years ago. 100 years ago, if you bought a beverage, it would be in typically reusable glass. But reusing glass, whether it's beer or, or water, doesn't exist really all that much anymore. In fact, you say, or you, you've written at least, that this whole idea of garbage is a modern one, that it really came about in the early 1950s when you had more complex materials. And I wonder if you could say a little bit about the public's relationship to tangible goods prior to that. Just around in the 1950s, we came out of some pretty tough stuff. We had two world wars, the Great Depression, all within a 30 to four year stretch. That's pretty tough. And the economy was challenged. Everyone was looking for a recovery. And also around that time, complex materials, plastics are the poster child of complex materials, but it could be many other complex uh, things that have factually made our lives significantly better, allowed people to access goods that they could never afford before. They became commercially really available. And when you compound complex materials and this idea of consumerism, which is really a modern idea as well, that's the recipe for waste. So 
let's look at someone alive a hundred years ago, which is really not that long ago, a few generations. An average lady around that time would buy just a few garments a year. Typically, she would make it herself from patterns and fabric. But then especially when it broke or there was a tear, she would mend it. Today, an average woman in the Western world buys 67 apparel items per year and uses them on average seven times before disposal, and many times never even wore them, they just went out of fashion. A human being alive today typically consumes 10 times more stuff than someone around in the 1950s. In fact, using your 100-year marker there, those items were made out of materials that were naturally recyclable, such as wood, right, or some kind yeah, of metal. I mean, that you could use over. Exactly. Think about the chair you may be sitting on or if you're driving, you know, the, the seat of your car. A hundred years ago, that chair was wood and maybe some metal items. And if you threw it out into the forest, the forest would eat it and have a wonderful time with it. Today, 40% of clothing is plastic. Another 30% is hybridized plastics with things like cotton, things like, you know, stretchy pants that are, feel like cotton, but they're primarily plastics like nylons and so on. The chair you're sitting on is typically probably foam and has some upholstery on it that is also typically all synthetic. And the challenge is, these are wonderful materials, but nature doesn't know what to do with them. So with waste, 25% ends up in our oceans, 2% is all that is globally recycled, and the rest of it we burn or bury. Tom, do you really think that they're wonderful materials? Are you saying that because that's a pat thing to say? Or do you really think that plastics and some of these complex materials are wonderful materials? That's sort of surprising coming from you. I do because, you know, plastics have had breakthrough in healthcare. There's many operations and procedures that simply could not exist and save lives today that without plastics. We couldn't have landed on the moon without plastics. We couldn't do so many things that we can do today. The challenge is we're abusing it a little bit. Well, I mean, a little bit is an understatement. We're abusing it tremendously, and it's because we're making things to break, because it's wonderful for business. And uh, if you keep buying things over and over, you're going to make more revenue. I began this discussion with you by suggesting that the soda can was the poster item for recycling, or it used to be, and you said that actually today it would be uh, recycled glass. And that gets at the point of what we think can be recycled and what actually can and is recycled. And one of the claims that you're making is that there's a vast amount of things that we could recycle, in fact, almost everything, but we choose not to do it. We've really limited our idea to these few items, such as the soda can. That's exactly right. And I wonder if you could make the case for us, persuade us that uh, most things are recyclable. What, what is your pitch on that? Because that's not how we think of it. Everything, I mean, truly everything can absolutely be recycled. We, I run a company, TerraCycle, and in 21 countries around the world, we recycle everything people thought couldn't be recyclable. Things like cigarette butts, chewing gum, dirty diapers, even femcare waste. I mean, you name it, everything can technically go around in a circle. And so for fun, let me ask you to pick any waste stream that you think may be challenging to recycle, and I'll tell you exactly how one can recycle it. Any waste stream? Yeah, so a waste stream could be something like soda bottles or uh, coffee cups or... Uh, Pens Wait, gar or garbage. Is yeah, it another word yeah. for garbage? Okay. Exactly. Okay. Okay. Yoga mats. Yoga mats. So yoga I'm, mats. I'm not even sure what they're made of. Well, and there you go. So <laughs> yoga mats are made typically from a foamed plastic compound, similar to your flip flops. That's almost the exact same thing. In fact, yoga mats and flip flops are brothers. Uh, just like plastic gloves and balloons and condoms are all brothers in a way. They're the same thing, just under different forms. So foamed plastic. It's challenging to recycle locally because, again, there's not that much value, but if you collect enough of it, you can shred it, you can then melt it, then uh, do this thing called compatibilization where you add a few other additives to get the right quality. And then from there, we've actually even taken uh, millions of yoga mats and recycled them into things like playgrounds and all sorts of other plastic objects. Okay, so something else. What about tennis shoes? Tennis shoes. So shoes are really typically made from things like rubbers and primarily there are sometimes leathers in them, but usually it's synthetic materials uh, like nylons and so on. Most shoes today are effectively plastic. So we actually do a lot of uh, shoe collections. Now, when we look at circular solutions, that, that really means when you move something around and around, a real buzzword here would be like circular economy. There are three ways to circularly process waste. So the first is reuse and actually in shoes, 98% of the shoes we collect, and we do millions of shoes, we can reuse. All that means is we have a pair, we clean it, and then we're able to sell it in uh, other countries where people can't afford brand new shoes. 
and a huge quantity can go into reuse. Typically, anything that can't be reused in the world of shoes is where we only have one of the two shoes. So there's an example where in those realms, we would look at, can it be upcycled, cutting it apart and putting it back together for a different function, or in, say a t-shirt could be taking a t-shirt and making it into a pillowcase. So it's repurposing. It. Exactly, yeah. Upcycling is by saying you don't value the purpose of the item, but you value its form and what it's made from. And then shoes can also be recycled. In fact, a large shoe company uh, today runs an amazing program where they take shoes and make it into sports track surfaces and so on. We do the same as well, where you basically shred the shoe, separate the textile component, which can then be made into this item called shoddy, which is basically the insulation for cars. All cars have an insulation layer between the metal part and the inside. And the rubber parts can be made into a surfacing for uh, running tracks. What's the most challenging thing to recycle? So the most challenging things from a technical point of view, take like a dirty diaper. We're actually launching a dirty diaper recycling in Holland next year. And dirty diapers are basically a plastic material uh, that has absorbed basically what you uh, put in the toilet. First, there's a big challenge in collecting it because you have all these regulations and, and health and safety concerns to deal with. And then once you get it in, you have to separate the organic pieces from the inorganic pieces. So when you are mixing fundamentally different elements together, like organics and inorganics, that's what starts making it a little bit more challenging. Not impossible by any stretch, but challenging. One of the biggest offenders that you've spoken about are the airlines. And when you get on an airplane, all of the garbage that is accrued over that flight, the paper, the plastic wrapping, cups, many plastic cups, is all just tossed, isn't it? The airlines are not recycling mm -hmm. any of this material. That's exactly right. And it's not even just the things you see, right? When you're an airline passenger, you see the dining wear. But did you know that your headrest cover will be thrown out? Did you know airlines change their uniforms periodically, which means millions of pounds of uniforms simply being thrown out and all the stuff that makes the actual system work. And now airlines, it's challenging because everyone has cost pressure. Airlines especially, they're really watching where they put their uh, teams and you know where they spend money. And it's extra work to separate out what can be recycled and get it recycled. And in some cases, the law prevents them from doing so. So for example, if an airline flies across an international border, everything off that airline must be incinerated according to the law. Um, domestically, it's a little easier, but even then it's hard for them to implement these uh, solutions. It costs money. And so the way to do it is one of two things. In the short term, figure out well, maybe if I recycle on, on my airline, I can get more passengers to fall in love with my airline and maybe that will allow me to sell more tickets. Maybe that's a short-term approach, uh, differentiate uh, by recycling. And in the long run, we have to design a way from making all the cups and everything on an airline disposable and somehow make it where instead, you know, perhaps when we're done drinking our favorite beverage, it gets collected and then washed later and then can be used again. Let me push you on the idea that everything can be recycled, or at least it's within our means to do so. What about items that are coated with or are themselves uh, poisonous chemicals or even radioactive material? It's an excellent question. So let's break these two apart into uh, poisons and then radioactivity. Poisons take something simple like bug repellent in aerosol. Now, when you think about recycling, let's just take aerosol containers because it's an interesting question. You know, many folks are thinking about just the metal that that aerosol container is made from. But the number one environmental issue of aerosols isn't the actual metal, it's the propellant inside. Uh, many aerosol containers like asthma inhalers, the propellant, the stuff that pushes the material out, is typically around 12,000 to one times more toxic for global warming potential than something like carbon dioxide. And so in aerosol recycling, what we really focus on is when you break the aerosol container apart to capture all the propellant, all the gases to allow it to be used again so that you don't release it into the environment causing massive global warming potential. Now, the residual chemical, well, you know, we're talking about something like pesticides, take like home pesticide like bug killer in an aerosol. When you recycle the metal an aerosol can is made from, it's typically done at incredibly high temperatures because you have to melt the metal. And at those temperatures, all those toxins will be burned off in the process. And if you do it at a high enough temperature, it will be burned off into very simple outputs. So it'll come out effectively as carbon or, or something along those lines. So if you do it properly 
everything can go into a good outcome. And uh, you also mentioned nuclear waste. A good example of nuclear waste that is in your home is uh, something like a smoke detector. Uh, smoke detectors have small uh, nuclear isotopes that allow for the product to function. And in recycling smoke detectors, the key is simply keeping or separating that component out and then treating that properly. Now, can nuclear waste be recycled? That's something that I don't have enough expertise on. But it's such a small percentage of the overall waste that's out there. The big offenders that we have to focus on are things like you know, disposable plastics. Well, finally, Tom, thank you so much for this interview. And I wonder, do you think we can use this interview more than once? Uh, well, I hope so. <laughs> Tom Zaki, thank you so much for speaking with us. It was my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Tom Zaki is the CEO and founder of TerraCycle. There is a finite amount of water on Earth, and of course it's recycled, but it's not distributed evenly. Now a new device powered by the sun can collect H2O from the driest of dry air next. It's what goes around on Big Picture Science. Nature has its own efficient recycling systems. For example, the carbon cycle that takes carbon out of the atmosphere and eventually puts it back in. Then there's the hydrological cycle that keeps Earth's 1,300 million trillion liters of water in circulation. However, that essential wet stuff is not distributed evenly on our planet. Now, an innovative device may help bring drinking water to arid places like the Sahara Desert by pulling it directly from the dry, dry air. This solar-powered water harvester is not a device so much as a material. It's a powder called a metal organic framework, or MOF, that is made up of a metal atom or atoms with organic atoms attached. The resulting molecular structure has lots of open spaces that snag and hold on to H2O. Think about the way that silica gel packets absorb water vapor. But this material, the MOF, does more than just absorb water it allows you to easily extract it. Now, you could design a moth to hold other molecules as well. Eugene Capiston is a graduate student in chemistry in the Yagi Laboratory at the University of California, Berkeley, where the water extraction device was made. Eugene, this is your workspace right here with all these vials and boxes and uh, tubes and things? Yeah, this is the space where I primarily spent all of my time 24-7. You and the, the lab here, and you've been part of this project, have developed an extraordinary device. But it's not really a device, is it? Well, I think it's all about the material which we use in this device. And we developed a new material called Metal Organic Framework, which can capture water from thin air. And the device, which we built based on this material, helps to capture this water, release it, and then collect it as liquid. When you say that this device can pull water out of thin air, can it pull water out of dry air? That's what our aim is. We are trying to see whether we can capture water from air at the relative humidity levels as low as 20 or 15 percent, which is typical for Death Valley during summer season. So you can pull water out of the dry air. Have you gone down to Death Valley and seen if you're able to pull water out of that <laughs> very arid air? Well, we didn't go to Death Valley. We did our experiments at uh, MIT roof because we tr were trying to show that the power of sunlight is enough to release water from this material. Is the roof of MIT in Cambridge, Massachusetts a particularly dry spot? Uh, actually, it's not that dry, but it was nice to show that this device can still work even in, during the day when you have clouds, for example, when you don't, don't have a direct sunlight. But we're aiming for the regions like uh, Arabian deserts and Chile deserts and even probably Arizona because it's one of the driest regions of the United States. 
Now, I expected to come in here and see a device, a mechanical device, something I could hold in my hands, or be cranks, or maybe you'd plug in or something. Can you explain to us how you put together this metal organic framework without any visible metal? To start with, we need a metal salt. We dissolve this metal salt, for example, zirconium chloride in liquid and common solvent, and we mix it with organic part. And then we heat it up to 100 degrees Celsius, and after a couple of days, you end up with a powder, uh, which then can be activated. So we basically remove the solvent out of the pore. And after that, you end up with extremely porous material. Okay, so you take a metal ion and you mix it with a organic and they're, are they in liquid form? They were in liquid form in this solvent, but when they meet each other and start building this arrangement, they become a solid. Is this the powder over here? Yeah, so this is approximately five grams of this powder, which uh, Probably. Can I pick this up? Yeah, you can. Okay. So I'm just picking up the vial. And what it looks like is a small vial about the length of my thumb. And it looks like it has white chalk, but it's not chalk. It's powdery like chalk. It looks like chalk, but uh, in reality, it has space between the organic and inorganic units. So we can put gas. In fact, if you fill the gas cylinder with this powder you can store three times more gas in the cylinder with moth rather than just empty cylinder with without this powder okay so let's just be clear when you say there's space in between you mean on the molecular level so if we were to look at this on the molecular level what would we see well we would see a lattice where metal ions are linked with this organic parts and most of the structure is just empty space where we can store gas or water molecules. So it would look like a scaffolding or a lattice, as you said, and so much of that is empty space and somehow that draws in the water molecules, the hydrogen and oxygen combination? Yes, the idea behind it is that this metal ions can make a favorable interactions with water molecules. So the water from thin air gets inside the framework and can be stored because it's kind of bound to the metal part of the structure. The core of the device is that we use moth powder layer on the top of the box and we allow uh, air to get through this powder, moth powder, to saturate moth with water. And the next step is to release this water back and we use the heat from the sunlight to increase the temperature of the moth layer so the water starts to come out of the pore. And then we collect this uh, water vapor using the condenser and uh, make droplets of water. So what you're doing is you're recycling water out of the dry air, water that would be otherwise very hard to obtain. Correct. Um, there is an enormous amount of water in the atmosphere present at any moment. And for some reason, we don't use this resource. And of course, it's more favorable to use this water rather than use source of ground water, which is not really recyclable, not renewable, while water in thin air, it is a renewable resource. Now, this is about a tablespoon, maybe a little bit more of material. How much water could you get from that? probably thousands of droplets, not much. But if you scale up this device and instead of having a teaspoon of the material, you have 2.5 pounds of uh, more for one kilo, you can potentially get one gallon of water daily at uh, humidity levels as low as 20%. Is it true that depending on the kind of metal that you use and the organic that you use to create this metal organic framework, you could trap and store other gases. So in this case, you're trapping water, but if you had used something else, you might be able to trap something else? Yeah, that's correct. And for example, in order to address the green effect, we want to capture carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. And we already show that using a different kind of metal part and different kind of organic linker, we can capture and store CO2. 
Well, Eugene, one last question. You're here in a chemistry lab. You are not wearing safety goggles. Yeah, I should wear this, but because professor is not around, <laughs> I'm allowed not to. <laughs> okay, you are busted. Yes. Eugene Kapustin, thank you so much for speaking with us and allowing me into your lab today. Thank you. It was a pleasure to invite you in the lab. Eugene Capiston is a graduate student in the Department of Chemistry, University of California, Berkeley. Water is essential to life, but there are other resources that are critical to sustaining our high-tech lifestyle. Elements such as copper, zinc, platinum, they're all needed by a technological society. The easily mined supplies are running low and cannot be recycled fast enough in the quantities we need. The way things are going, within 50 years, people will be tempted to break into houses to pull the copper pipes out of the wall. But there's an enormous cache of these elements off Earth. One country that foresees that space mining will become a big industry may surprise you, as it itself is merely the size of Rhode Island. Etienne Schneider, the Vice Prime Minister of the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg, says his country hopes to become the center of the asteroid mining business. NASA is already working on the technology to develop that, says former NASA Ames Research Center Director Pete Warden. And the first targets for mining? Water and fuel for use in space. But eventually, we can mine essential elements and bring them back to a resource-depleted Earth. Minister Schneider, Luxembourg, it's a small country. It's hemmed in by France, Germany, Belgium, total population less than that of Seattle, Washington. And yet Luxembourg aspires to play a prominent role in the development of space. What's motivating you to do that? Well, you know, Luxembourg's success is uh, due to the fact that we always uh, try to reinvent ourselves over, over the last 50 years. We started some 100 years ago as a steel manufacturer's country, which declined, the steel business declined mainly in the 1970s. Then we, we had to reinvent ourselves and to put it into a nutshell, we want to gather all these um, uh, startups and companies in the space resource business you know, I'm, I'm looking into that business due to uh, Pete Worden, which even though it sounded like science fiction at the beginning, I'm, I'm now convinced that this is a really great business model for the future. So somewhat analogous to the Silicon Valley, there isn't very much silicon being grown in the Silicon Valley anymore. I, I hope I haven't misspoke there, but it is still the center of development of this industry. So the thinking and well, the financing too is largely done here. You have a similar idea for space mining. I take it you see this as a really a growth industry. Absolutely. We will have a uh, legal framework in one month's time which allows companies to develop their activities in space business and to um, own whatever they find in space and to use it. Minister Schneider, you mentioned Pete Warden, a former director of NASA's Ames Research Center, amongst many other things. And uh, why don't we bring Pete in here? NASA has pioneered many of the important technologies, and for that matter, the science of asteroid mining. There was even talk of NASA capturing an asteroid and hauling it back to the vicinity of Earth. I haven't heard much about that recently. Is there some fundamental development necessary before anybody can actually do this? Well, NASA, of course, has had a long interest in, in asteroids. Uh, indeed, they figure prominently in exploration plans. But uh, in the last five or ten years, there's been a number of analyses. And indeed, we did a series of joint symposia with Luxembourg. Uh, but the key thing is that the market is already maturing for resources, particularly as we go beyond low Earth orbit. For example, there's a market in the, in the near term uh, for fuel for geosynchronous satellites. Uh, as we go deeper into space, if people like Elon Musk plan to go to Mars, the fuel for these things and supplies are going to come from space resources. But, you know, uh, kind of naively, I would think, well, look, if a satellite needs more fuel, why don't we just send it up in a rocket? But then again, I looked up the, uh, the density of water. It's like 62 pounds per cubic foot. That's 28 kilograms per cubic foot. Yeah, so if you filled your suitcase with water, I guess it would have to be ice and try to check it in on, on your next airline flight. They would charge you extra for it. So I guess it just takes a lot of money to put anything up with a rocket. Would it be cheaper, really, to mine something? like, well, as simple as water from an asteroid? Well, from an uh, energetic standpoint, which is what really matters in space, it's how much 
energy it takes to move uh, material from point A to point B, moving material from the surface of the Earth to deeper space, like the geosynchronous belt or beyond, costs a certain amount of energy. It turns out that the energy cost to bring things from asteroids is much smaller, a, a factor of two or three smaller. So assuming the infrastructure is in place, uh, it looks quite promising to provide fuel from space resources, just from an energetic standpoint. Pete, there are several American companies interested in asteroid mining. What's their projected time scale? In other words, when did they hope to stick the first shovel, I guess it would be a robotic shovel, into an asteroid? Well, indeed, there are a number of companies, and, and in fact, a couple of them are already uh, have joint ventures with Luxembourg. But uh, the first product is the technology, uh, the propulsion technology, the ability to image things. Uh, that has an immediate uh, market payoff in terms of studying the Earth and uh, getting around in Earth orbit. The next product is going to be information about the asteroids, and there are missions planned within a few years by these companies to send missions to do an assay. And uh, that information itself is of quite great value. NASA has developed the technologies to extract resources from asteroids. This has been a 20-year program. So the, the, we're poised at the ability to, to take technology that already exists uh, with systems, small systems that are being developed, and within a few years actually send them to asteroids and begin to do our first extraction of resources. Uh, I'm convinced uh, within 10 years uh, we'll begin to see uh, as I said initially, fuel will be a, a paying uh, product from space. So it's it's going to move pretty quickly, and it already is. You know, when I lived in Europe, and that was about 30 years ago or something, much of the television broadcasting on the continent was dominated by RTL. I think that's Radio Television Luxembourg. Uh, your small country was able to set itself up as a major player in what is, after all, a mammoth industry. It sounds like you're about to do that again. Yeah, absolutely. I think we have quite a long um, history in uh, doing crazy things with quite a lot of success. So I, I'm, I'm quite sure that this will be a, a big success as well. Deputy Prime Minister Etienne Schneider, thank you so very much for being with us. Thank you. Pete Warden, thank you for being with us. Thank you. Etienne Schneider is the Vice Prime Minister of the Grand Duchy of Luxembourg. Pete Warden is the Chairman of the Breakthrough Prize Foundation and the former Director of the NASA Ames Research Center. You know, a lot of people think of recycling, of course, as something, you know, it's a social good, good for the environment. You know, you ought to do it. But as we've heard, this is more than that. We're going to run out of this stuff. It's not just a nice thing to do. It will become an essential thing to do. And within this century, the asteroids, you know, let's start digging them up. Meanwhile, we can recycle water here on Earth with innovation. That's right. Water, all that water, and so, so little of it is, is potable. But on the one hand, you could say this is an obvious thing to do. Just take it out of the air. But finding a practical way to do that, that's a, that's a real breakthrough. Coming up, there's at least one exception to the everything can be recycled idea, a resource upon which life depends that can't be replenished within the time we need it. It takes thousands of years to create soil, at least in the amount of soil that we really need for farming. So it's not correct to think that we can just use up what we have and we'll make more, as though there's a soil factory somewhere that can just pump out more soil. Why the disappearance of soil is grounds for concern. Next. It's What Goes Around on Big Picture Science. We've been talking about the innovative ways in which we can recycle materials and resources. And we've heard the argument that everything can be recycled. Well, maybe not. We're going to talk about a resource that cannot be replenished. And for that, we need to get grounded. All right, it's not the gloves that are coming off this time. It's the shoes. And taking off my socks so that I can walk on the ground. Here, ah, that feels great. Walk over here, ow, stones, ow, ow, ah, the grass. When I was a kid, I hardly ever wore shoes in the summer.
I grew up in the 70s. Are you reeling in the years? I remember being barefoot a lot and running around in the woods or on the beach. In some cultures, going barefoot is standard practice. There was a time, even in this culture, when developing calluses on your feet was a routine accompaniment to summer. Hmm, I feel a kids these days lament coming on. Kids these days don't run around barefoot on the natural ground, and adults these days don't run around barefoot on natural ground. Hi, Seth. Hey, Molly. Wait, 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 you can't come in without shoes. Why? Uh, it messes up the carpet. And, and not only that, it's, it's kind of company policy. You know, it's imagine if everybody's walking around with bare feet. It's more feet. comfortable, though. Well, sure, it's more comfortable for you. But in here, there might be a thumbtack on the floor. Who knows? There might be a you know particularly stiff loop of carpet. We don't want to get sued. Just put on the shoes. You know, a couple remarkable things have happened in the last decade or two that have created the situation where we spend 90 to 95% of our time inside. So we are definitely not walking barefoot and we're definitely not touching the natural ground. And it's that loss of that firsthand connection with the natural world that I think has led us in the wrong direction. Even though personally, I don't approve of bare feet except on bath mats or in bed or occasionally on bears, I take writer Paul Bogard's point. We've created an artificial space between our bare feet and the bare ground with uh, rubber soles, cotton fabric, poured concrete. And if we're not paving over the ground, we're drenching it in fertilizer to feed monocultures or artificially verdant lawns. The latter a practice that Mr. Bogart assails in a June 2017 op-ed in the New York Times. The Ground Beneath Us is his book, From the Oldest Cities to the Last Wilderness, What Dirt Tells Us About Who We Are. What we're paving over is more than ground or dirt, Paul Bogard says. It is soil, a non-renewable resource. Soil is alive. It is teeming with microbes, which are healthy for plants as well as for us. Those dirty feet you had at the end of a summer's day long ago, a good thing. We need, especially as kids, to be exposed to the microbes in the soil that it helps build our immune system. And to be cut off from that has made us more susceptible to certain diseases, uh, certain afflictions later in life. Can you give us a sense of just what's living in the soil? In fact, I think you write that the ground is alive. It's living. Um, and I believe that microbial ecologists uh, using DNA sequencing have found a diversity of organisms when they studied uh, the soil in New York City's Central Park. What did they find? <laughs> well, they found an incredibly wild and alive world. They didn't know specifically what they would find. They had an idea that they would find lots of life. And even they were stunned to find the amount and uh, diversity of life that they did. They said it was as diverse as they would have found if they had been doing the same soil sampling in a tropical rainforest somewhere. So in the middle of the largest city, surrounded by all these people, there is this amazing life in the soil. Now, I wonder, I was using the term soil interchangeably with mm -hmm. dirt, and you said ground. Do you want to distinguish between those three? Yeah, it's a great question, and one I, I wrestled with when I started working on the book. First of all, I chose ground very specifically because I wanted us to pay attention to whatever is directly under our feet. Is it pavement? Are we inside? Is it grass? Are we out in the woods? Whatever it is, what's the ground? It's kind of a pedestrian word. It's not a flashy word. It's just the ground, right? It's our day-to-day -day life. Well, how do we experience the planet? And then there is this important distinction between soil and dirt. And I I think that dirt is kind of the general catch-all word. People know it. Uh, if you say dirt, they have a vision of what it is. They don't so much have a vision maybe of soil, and yet soil is really the thing that life depends on. It is in many respects, you could say living dirt, if you want to say that, but soil is really what the people who study the ground are really concerned about, is this living ground, which is the soil. Earlier in the show, we were talking about the idea that everything can be recycled. But soil, however, you write, is not renewable. Why is it not renewable, and, and what is it that we're doing to it to deplete this valuable resource? 
Well, soil is not recyclable in the sense that it takes thousands of years to create soil, at least in the amount of soil that we really need realistically for farming. So it's not correct to think that we can just use up what we have and we'll make more as though there's a soil factory somewhere that can just pump out more soil. There are things that we can do, and more and more people are talking about these things, to conserve and cultivate the soil that we have. And those are in responses to the kind of really intensive uh, modern agricultural practices that are applying so much pressure to our soil. I'm thinking especially of tilling techniques that really disrupt the ground and leave it exposed, or the application of chemical synthetic pesticides and fertilizers that really actually kill a lot of the life in the soil. Once you start to realize that, and then you walk as I did on a lot of places where it's just a few inches of soil between your feet and the bedrock, you realize that we're dealing with a resource that for all intents and purposes can't be recycled and we need to conserve and preserve and treat with care the resource that we do have right now. You write of your affection for Iowa as a child, and I grew up in the Midwest, so I can identify with this. Mm -hmm. uh, but then you also said that when you returned to the state, your opinion changed. And I wonder if you could describe why that was. Yeah, absolutely. I grew up in Minneapolis, and uh, my grandparents uh, lived in southern Illinois, and so we would at least once a year, drive south on I-35 down through Iowa and then cut over to Illinois and, and continue on our way. And as a child, I always loved the sight of endless cornfields and at the horizon, the farm lights next to the farmhouse. I just thought it was really romantic and quite beautiful. And I still do think it's a beautiful sight, but now that I know about the way that we farm and, and the fact that so much of Iowa has been converted into monoculture crops, either of corn or soybeans, and, and the effect on the rest of the natural world of those monoculture crops. It's a little harder to see those long rows of corn or those empty fields in such a romantic way that I used to. Could you expound on what the effect of monocultures are on the local soil, but also, as you said, worldwide? Yeah, I think in general, when we decide that we're going to grow a single crop, a monoculture crop, we gear everything toward that crop. And so that means, unfortunately, with synthetic fertilizers and pesticides, herbicides, that we want to essentially kill everything else and only grow the one crop that we want. Those synthetic chemicals and fertilizers, herbicides, pesticides, they end up in the soil in a place like Iowa, in a place like Minnesota, where I'm from, a lot of those chemicals then run off with the soil into the water, go down the Mississippi and create these dead zones that folks have heard about in Mexico City. So there's a huge price for the way that we've chosen as a society to farm in these monoculture, these single crops. You mentioned that we spend a great deal of time indoors, or at least with shoes on, uh, not outdoors barefoot. And certainly our relationship to the ground has changed. Uh, we've paved over much of the ground. And I wonder if you could describe what happens to the soil when we pave over it, and in what ways does that kill soil? Well, you, you just said it, right? It does kill the soil. And I think for people to understand that we have to understand first that the ground is alive, that soil is full of life. What happens when we pave over, uh, soil scientists call it soil sealing, which is kind of this eerie term they use to really describe well what happens, which is the pavement seals off the soil from the water, the air, the nutrients that it needs to continue to be alive. So essentially, as I, one person I interviewed said to me, asphalt or pavement is the land's last crop. It's the, la the last thing the ground is going to support. Once you've paved over an area, it essentially kills that. And you can tear up pavement, you can try to rehabilitate soil, but talk about a costly process and an unlikely process as well. And one of the crazy things that's happening is that we're paving over a lot of the most fertile land that we have even as we have more and more mouths to feed. So these are leading us in, in some dangerous directions. I wonder what the role of lawns is in depleting this valuable 
soil, and certainly you've written on this as an op-ed for the New York Times. Now, when I was growing up, my parents had a laissez-faire approach to our lawn. Hmm. Uh, it was bumpy, it was grassy, there were weeds, there were little flowers, but the neighbors on either side had these manicured lawns with bright green, uniformly bright green grass. And I'm wondering what the price is that we're paying for these highly manicured lawns. Yeah, it's a wonderful question. I think that the point that I was really making in the New York Times piece writing about lawns is that we have so much lawn in the United States. We have three times as much lawn as we do irrigated corn, and we have a whole lot of corn in this country. So we have a lot of lawn. Lawn that added together would be a state the size of Georgia. And it's costly to the rest of the ecosystem in the sense of when you create these bright green sort of golf course type lawns, in order to do that, in most cases, you have to use a lot of synthetic, often fossil fuel fertilizers and pesticides that, like the corn we were talking about earlier, it's a monoculture. It's a single crop of turf grass. It kills everything else. It doesn't leave any room for insects, for example, to live. And so I wouldn't say that lawns are bad. I mean, I, I grew up in the suburbs of Minneapolis. I, I love lawns. I, I There's lots of good. It's just that we have so much of it and they exact such a cost to us and we can do so much better. What if we took 20 or 25 percent of our lawn areas that's now just planted in grass, planted in something else that really adds to the lives that we live? And those lives include insects, for example. As the soil disappears, you write, a food chain is broken, and we're aware of the plight of the honeybee that has been uh, disappearing. But other insects are threatened as well, and that those native grasses and that soil create an ecology, a whole ecology for insects as well, and they are also disappearing. Yeah, they really are. I think, you know, this is something that most folks are probably unaware of. One of the stunning estimates that I found researching this book was that of insect populations having fallen by some 40 or 45 percent over the last 35 years. So we've taken this rich, vibrant world of insects that do so much to keep this world alive, and we've cut their numbers almost in half. Again, when we think about lawns, you know, one thing we can do to work back against the loss of insects is to use our lawns to create a place where insects are welcome. Um, that's a positive thing that anybody can do with a lawn. Well, finally, let me ask you this. You're in a city right now. You're sitting in a, a radio studio in St. Paul, Minnesota. It is a farming state, certainly. Hmm. How far would you have to go from where you're sitting now to be able to take off your shoes and run your feet through soil, real soil, healthy living soil? Where do you think you'd have to go? <laughs> well, that's a more complex question than you probably <laughs> uh, probably think. You know what? My, my first honest answer is I don't know. And here I am, the guy who wrote the book, The Ground Beneath Us, right? I, I live in Minneapolis. I really don't know where you'd have to go to reach soil. But my guess is that I could get there uh, within a half hour drive, that we still have enough farming around this area that I can reach that soil. But where it's complex is, is it healthy soil? That's a complex question. It used to be easy. You know, we used to run out the back door in our bare feet and we would be on the natural ground. Now it's become a lot harder to have that same experience. And I think the costs are mounting. Paul Bogard, thank you so much for speaking with us. Uh, it's been my pleasure. Thank you. Paul Bogard is an assistant professor of English at James Madison University and the author of The Ground Beneath Us, From the Oldest Cities to the Last Wilderness, What Dirt Tells Us About Who We Are. Kind of makes you want to run outside and make mud pies. Yeah, you roll around in the dirt. <laughs> well, it's interesting because dirt, you know, you, you never think of that as a resource and certainly not an inexhaustible resource. We should be clear, soil is different from dirt, but either way, that's right. Maybe soil is really something we can't recycle. But, you know, recycling is a new thing. A hundred years ago, nobody was thinking about recycling. But on the other hand, in the 1950s, you know, when I was a kid, nobody thought about recycling. We were using one-tenth the amount of stuff that we use today. It just, really? Oh, yeah, it was never on the horizon. So, yeah, I mean, we're the first generation ever to feel that the Earth's bounty is finite, right? I mean, that's a lesson, and clearly it's also a challenge. 
And I also find it encouraging that we're finding new ways to get resources, whether it's squeezing water out of desert air or mining asteroids for elements that are running short here on Earth. Thanks to the team that produced this show one week and then keep coming back for more. Senior producer Gary Niederhoff, operations manager Barbara Vance, and intern Daniel Marino. Thanks also to financial support from Rena Shulsky David and Sammy David and the William K. Bose Jr. Foundation. Big Picture Science is produced at the SETI Institute, a nonprofit scientific and education organization whose scientists study the origin and nature of life, including the study of aeolian phenomena on other planets. And a big thanks also to our listeners. Your ears have been attuned to an episode of Big Picture Science called What Goes Around. And if you want to hear more Big Picture Science episodes over and over, we support your visit to our archive at bigpicturescience.org. And if you're a podcast listener but prefer listening to over-the-air radio because we're not running short of radio waves, check out the listing on our website of radio stations that carry the program. And if your local station is not on that list, consider letting them know you like this show. <laughs>